Hi everyone, thanks for joining um, our second weekly, bi-weekly office hours with Lisa Wang, uh, CEO and founder of SheWorks. And um, today Lisa is joined by Nitya Rajendran, who is a senior associate at Tribeca Venture Partners. And um, they will be talking about different things related to um, your business finances and business model. Um, and then at the end of the session, we will be opening it up to audience Q&A. So um, feel free throughout to just drop your questions in the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. Um, this uh, webinar, we are proud to co-host um, Alice and Lisa Wang and PepsiCo um, as a support for the Women Made Initiative, which is a PepsiCo initiative supporting female founders. Um, and if you want to continue support after this, um, please join the Women Made community on helloalice.com. It's free to join and you can get access to peer mentorship, expert mentorship, and different resources there um, available to support you and your business growth. Okay, so Lisa, would you uh, take us away with the topic we'll be learning about today? Definitely. So welcome everyone to today's live Female Founders Office Hours. My name is Lisa Wang and I'm the founder of SheWorks and I'm really excited to have everyone here today for our second office hours. Um, everyone here who's part of the community at Woman Made and I'm here today with Nitya, who's an investor at Tribeca Venture Partners and we will be talking about how to own your financials and business model. So if the people who are here, um, I would love to just know where you're tuning in from. Just type it in the chat what city you are um, and we'll shout some of you out. So let's see um where everyone is coming in from awesome so we've got shani from washington dc maria from london um, we've got someone from la and bobby from new york jill from san francisco hi from dubai awesome it's great to see international presence um, who else do we have? Houston from Abbey. We got someone from DC. Allison from Pittsburgh. Jane Harvey from Scotland. Adriana from Austin. Beck and Stephanie from Minneapolis. And Rosanna from South Carolina. So awesome. Great to see so many of you tuning in from different places. And part of the reason why we do these online is so that we can really democratize access to the incredible knowledge that the investors who we bring on have. So before we get started, I want to say a quick thank you to PepsiCo for making these office hours possible and Alice for hosting us. So this is going to be an engaging, informative hour. And as you hear interesting quotes or valuable nuggets of information, I highly encourage you to write it down, tweet it out, um, share it on social and tag PepsiCo, Lisa Wang wins and hello, Alice. Um, and as we continue with the conversation today, I will start off with moderating and asking questions media around our lesson. And um, as you have questions, of course, share them and we will get to them in the second half of today's lesson. So without further ado, today we are joined by Nitya and she's a senior associate at Tribeca Venture Partners. She serves as a board observer at ACV Auctions and Damio. Prior to joining Tribeca Venture Partners, she was an investment banking analyst at Lazard, where she received the Andre Meyer Fellowship. And there she also worked on mergers and acquisitions, as well as restructurings across numerous sectors within the middle market group. And her passion for entrepreneurship began at Georgetown University, where she was the director of operations at the Social Innovation Public Service Fund, which was a $1.5 million fund dedicated to funding student and alumni projects. So obviously she has a really wide range of experience that will be useful and valuable to all of us today. So Nitya, welcome to Office Hours. And I would love to just start off with you telling us about your investment thesis and what gets you most excited about um, some of the founders or companies that you meet. Yeah, absolutely. Well, hi guys, it's nice to meet all of you. Um, I'm happy to tell you a little bit about Tribeca and what kind of excites us here and um, what I specifically like in entrepreneurs just to start out. So uh, at Tribeca, we're doing mostly early stage investing. So seed and series A companies across tons of different industries. Um, and I would say what excites me the most about all of this stuff is at the end of the day, it's about meeting with all these really smart, passionate entrepreneurs like you guys. Um, sometimes I kind of have to like pinch myself. I can't believe that this is my job that I get to like wake up and just talk to really smart, awesome people. Um, and then, you know, getting to actually invest in those companies. We're pretty hands-on investors. Um, so we actually are pretty, you know, 
responsive and, and proactive in helping our companies um, execute on their visions. So, you know, that's, I think, one of the most rewarding parts of my job is actually working closely with our entrepreneurs to help them um, build their companies up. Awesome. So I want to dive in today to our lesson around financials and numbers and business model, because I think sometimes this can be a really intimidating place for founders, especially if they don't consider themselves numbers or math people. Um, so if we just start with what are the types of numbers that you need to be aware of as an early stage company, um, you know, when you're presenting them to an investor? Yes. So I think you have touched on a really good point, I think just to kind of as a, as a preface to all of this, I think financial models, I think it scares a lot of entrepreneurs because a lot of entrepreneurs think that's not what they do for a living. Like you're not an accountant probably, um, maybe you are, but I think it can be really daunting. And I wanna explain just kind of what the purpose, when, when, on, when investors are talking to early stage entrepreneurs about their numbers or their financial models, I think most investors know that like, most of these numbers like, aren't super real, like when you think about projected financials. Um, but what we're really trying to understand is how do you think about the business? So like, if you're a, you know, B2B SaaS company, like how big do you think those contract values are gonna be? How long do you think those will last? How many customers do you think you're gonna have? So it's really much more about the assumptions driving the model. So go to go into like specific numbers that you might need to know, so you should think around in terms of like, you should know your historical numbers and your projected. So depending on the type of company, there are gonna be specific nuances to that. But like high level, you should have a sense of like your annual revenue, monthly revenue. Um, if there is a recurring piece of your business, how much, what percentage is recurring versus one time. Um, you should understand bookings or GMV. And I'm happy to talk about any of these, by the way, like more specifically, if you guys have questions. Um, and then you should understand, like, if you're a consumer company, like, how many customers have you had so far? What's the average order value? Have you seen repeat rates? If you have a referral program, have you, like, what's like the average number of referrals you see? If you're more of a B2B company, then, you know, what's the average contract value? Um, what's the tenure of the contract? What does your pipeline look like? But I think at the end of the day, it's really important that you have at least some of these high level numbers really down pat. Um, Cause they can really like bring the meeting to a halt. If someone's like, Hey, what do you think you're going to do in revenue this year? And you're like, I don't know. Have it, have an answer and explain kind of the assumptions that went into those answers. Great. So it seems like there's very different numbers to think about whether you're a B2B versus a B2C company, where you know, usually if B2C, you're looking at user acquisition um, kind of at scale, like repeat customers, whereas the B2B side, you know, sometimes that can take a significantly longer time to even land one contract. But if you do land a contract with a, you know, a large corporation, then that is enough because it, we know that it, how long it takes to implement a pilot into an entire organization. Yeah. And so it's, it is. Sorry, what about a B two B to C company? Because I know a lot of founders might have two sided marketplaces. How do you talk about that? Yeah, marketplace companies are super interesting, and we love investing in them at TBP. So marketplace companies, I think, can be tricky when you're an early stage founder because you're in this like sort of weird like chicken and the egg problem of like. I build up supply, do I build up demand? Like, what do I do? Um, and it can sometimes be hard to like think about traction in that way. Um, but a lot of the same metrics um, are the same ones that you should, you know, understand and sort of think about. So, you know, still revenue. You're looking at GMV also, so gross merchandise value that's coming through your platform. And if you're a marketplace, you probably have, um, you know, the take rate on that GMV. So you can talk about like how you think about take rate, and GMV because like maybe you're going to take a low take rate in the beginning because you just want to encourage people to transact on your platform and you don't really care right now about monetization. You can explain that to investors and say, you know, right now maybe take rates 5%, but I imagine, you know, being able to get this to 8% in the next year, then 10% eventually. Um, so again, it's more about like the assumptions and how you sort of think about growing the business and scaling it. But otherwise, a lot of the same, the same metrics are the same. And you want to maybe show um, 
the balance of the two sides of the supply side versus the demand side and how those two things are growing and how you're kind of balancing those. Got it. And for those who don't know the terms, could you define what GMV and take rate are? Yes. So GMV is gross merchandise value. So that is the amount, like the dollar volume that's actually getting transacted on your platform. So for example, if someone, you know, if you're a marketplace and someone buys a product from someone else for $100, that GMV then is $100. But you as the platform, you're not, you don't get the $100, right? So you would typically have a take rate. So that's the percentage of that transaction that you're entitled to take because you facilitated it and brought the two parties together. So your take rate might be 5%, in which case you get $5 out of that $100 transaction. Great. Um, so you've, you've already touched upon a couple times the story, right? The story around the numbers and how you paint that picture. So could you talk about um, what kind of story you're looking for and especially how a pre-revenue company might talk about their story? Yes, that's a great question. So, so much about, you know, building a company and specifically pitching to investors is really about storytelling at the end of the day. So when you're, when you're sitting in my seat and you're an investor, we want to, we want to back companies that can grow and scale like crazy. So like there are a lot of really awesome businesses out there, but a lot of them aren't venture back little businesses. And that's so fine. Like I've worked with tons of companies in my prior career where, um, they were companies that like were fully owned by management teams and they grew them to like nice, healthy businesses, but not venture backable. So venture backable, at least to my firm and to many other firms, means something along the lines of like, can this be you know, a multi-billion dollar company at some point? That's the kind of exit that we're looking for. So when you're storytelling, everything should sort of line up with how does this eventually down the line become this you know, ginormous company? You can start at a high level thinking about, you know, the market size for this company. Um, you know, you want to know that this is like, if it's like a $100 million market opportunity, well, you'd have to penetrate 100% of the market to get to a $100 million company. So probably not fun to back hold. But I think is a good way to start when you think about your numbers is like, when you're painting that story for the investors is this is a huge, huge, huge market and you're excited to tackle it. And then when you get into like actually your company specific numbers um, and you're building the financial model, you do kind of want to see that hockey stick growth. Now you shouldn't like lie or fabricate. Like if you don't think anything that you're putting in that model can happen, don't do that. Like that's no one, the investors will figure that out. And then like, that's not putting you in a good position. So it's more about understanding like what are the levers of your business? So if you like, you know, if you're like a consumer company and you're selling jewelry or something, like what does it look like to acquire customers? Like how many customers do you reasonably think you'd be able to get per year? Um, what do you think is going to be the average order value? Like what are your price points for your various jewelry pieces? Um, how often do you think people will come back per year? Um, those are the various levers of the business that you can use to drive your financial model. And ideally, hopefully, if you're going for venture money, you'll see sort of like a hockey stick um, growth. So how do you really like, if you took in a couple more million dollars, like what would that do? How would that kind of create that more of an inflection for the growth? Great. Yeah. So what I'm hearing is a lot of it is about when you have an input, what's the output? Right. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I think people will focus on just the input, you know, like this is what we are doing, but then they don't actually translate into. And then as a result, we're going to get here. And these are our milestones. Yes. Yes. And I think like it's important again, like I think I mentioned earlier, but like for really early stage companies where like maybe you're pre-revenue or you're really early in revenue, no investor is going to like 100% hold you accountable for these numbers because I think people get scared when they put these numbers into a financial model that like investors are going to like freak out if they like don't hit their numbers next year or whatever. And like, sure, you don't want to really miss your numbers like by that much. Cause like that's not necessarily the best sign, but it's also okay. It's much more about understanding how do all of these pieces sort of fit together and how do you think about things? Mm -hmm. 
so what do you what are you looking for in five year projections? Like, you know, by the end of five years, do they need to be at a hundred million or you know, what's what's kind of an average? That's a good question. I don't know if there's like an average because it really depends on the industry, the company. Um, so much of this stuff is really dependent upon um, the kind of business that you're growing. So sure, for like a B2B SaaS company, like there's a certain revenue directory that people might expect. Um, or for a consumer company, but there are also lots of really great companies where they don't turn on monetization for a really long time. Like if you think of like a network based company, like you're judging that company less based on a certain revenue trajectory and more on like a user trajectory. So I wouldn't say there are like any hard and fast rules for like in five years, we expect to see X amount of revenue. It's more just like, do we see this at, you know, within 10 years getting to become eventually like a billion dollar company where this could be a huge exit. Mm -hmm. Got it. Um, and so when we're starting out and we talked briefly about market size, um, a lot of times founders will say to me, well, there's so many different ways to size our market opportunity. Do we go top down, bottom up? Um, what, what would you recommend for our founders? Yeah. So I think the founders that actually do a really good job with market sizing um, when they present to me and my team are the founders who actually show us a couple of different ways they could approach market sizing. Um, so they'll maybe do both um, bottoms up and top down. And I think the reason that's, that's worked well in the past is because it shows that the entrepreneur is really thoughtful. Um, again, so much of this is for early stage investing is, believing in this entrepreneur and believing that, you know, he or she can execute on the vision. And so understanding how he or she thinks and um, getting into the thought process is really important. So when you can do, if you can show kind of both approaches, it just shows us that you're being really thoughtful, that you've really spent a lot of time thinking about this and if both, you know, show that this can be huge. That's, you know, even better. And can you give us an example of what a top down uh, market sizing and a bottoms up is for those who don't know? Sure. So like top down is potentially like the simpler way of, of doing it. So it could be like if you're selling you know, shampoo, let's pick that at random. So if you're, if you're selling shampoo and you're like 95% of the population uses shampoo. So in the U.S. and so I'm going to you know, take 95% of the U.S. population is my addressable market. That's my addressable market for shampoo. So that's like very overly simplistic, right? Because, well, what about dry shampoo? Or what about people who don't want to use shampoo? Or I don't know. There are lots of other things like that go into that. First, like, you know, men and women shampoo or specific needs, whatever. So it gets, it gets much more fragmented than just that general number. So the bottoms up approach is you saying something like, um, okay, there are this many people in the U.S. who use um, liquid shampoo for, um, like, to protect, like, their, their hair coloring. So based on that, like, and I think I can sell, you know, X number of products per year at this price point, so that's how you sort of get into the, the market size that way. It was more looking at it from like your price point, the number of bottles you think you could sell per year. Great. Let me know if that makes sense to everybody in the chat. Yes, because we can go into that more too. And there are a lot of good blog posts, by the way, written about that. Great. So we have a question from Nicola. She says, how much detail needs to be in the financial model to back up your funding requirement? Does it need to be bottom up on staff costs and positions? That's a really good question. And um, it partially depends on where you are, like from a traction perspective. So if when we invest, when we're doing mostly Series A companies, so that means like they have maybe about like a million-ish in annual revenue. Um, in those cases, we do prefer to see more detail. So like, for example, a, rev a very classic revenue buildup that we'll see in our models at the stage that we're looking at is they'll say, okay, if you have you know, three salespeople and we're hiring one new salesperson every two months and it takes six months for them to ramp up and this is their quota, then this is, you know, how that will feed into how much more additional revenue we get. But if you're at a much earlier stage, like, so let's say you, you know, have a little bit of revenue or no revenue, 
Um, we don't expect to see that. Now don't hard code your numbers. Don't say like, oh, I'm gonna get make 100,000 this year and you know a million next year. Cause that's not helpful. I don't know how you got that number. Um, but definitely show, show the assumptions that you're doing, but it doesn't need to be um, quite as detailed as that. It can be something like, you know, we expect to close three contracts this year or have, you know, X number of customers this year and these are our price points and here's the output. So just the, the financial models as you go through the venture funding process from a pre-seed to a seed to an A, B, C, D, the financial models will be expected to get more and more complex as you go through those funding cycles. But at the earliest stages, it doesn't need to be hyper detailed. Great. Um, so what I'm hearing is, again, it's all about the story, right? All about your conviction around your inputs and your outputs and um, showing that you have really thought through all the costs involved and how that's gonna result in hitting the next milestone. Yep, yep. Great. Um, so we have another question from Kirti and she says, what are, what are some of the tips for growing customer base in a two-sided marketplace with no direct competitor? That's another really good question. So we have a lot of these two-sided marketplaces in our portfolio. And so we've seen, you know, a couple of different things work. Um, one thing that, and it, so it totally depends on your industry and like ultimately who you're trying to sell to. Um, but I can give you an example. So, you know, two of our companies have had a really, as they've sort of grown, one thing that they do is like, they'll actually go to like various, um, even though they're mostly like online, they'll actually go to various cities where they're trying to like roll out. So like, let's say they're trying to make a big push in like the South for the Southeast customers. Like they'll set up shop in like a bunch of different um, hubs in the Southeast, like Atlanta or, or like Charleston or whatever. And they'll host like little pop-up events, um, little community events, but they find like those grassroots efforts where they're really on the ground and really like add a lot of momentum to building up um, their marketplace. So I'd say that's something that's been really helpful. Um, just doing a lot of survey data as well. So like, you know, reaching out to the various people that already, they already have, what do they like, what do they not like? Um, and then that can help you sort of iterate on your model. But I would say actually the grassroots effort has been really helpful in terms of building up marketplace businesses in our portfolio. Yeah, I would, I would say that, you know, organic word of mouth, especially in the beginning is always important to show that you can acquire customers and really do that sort of um, survey even in a way that's not scalable in the beginning. And I think it's always important for founders to remember that you do things um, initially that don't scale because that's how you really listen and understand your customers. Yeah, I think that's so important. So much of it in the beginning is like, you're trying to understand like, how do you build your product in a way that like, it will really 100% resonate with your customers. And so it's okay that like in the beginning, like you do a lot of trial and error, you do a lot of just talking to them. Um, that's really important at the end of the day. And then, you know, that will help you find product market fit and then be able to scale. There aren't a lot of shortcuts, unfortunately. Um, a question from Jasmine who says, I'm the founder of a clean beauty and wellness company that curates brands that adhere to the highest standards of clean and sustainable practices. How do you value an early stage company with very little revenue? Yeah, that's a good question. So I would say, this is very annoying to hear, so I'm sorry, but valuation is more art than science at the early stage. Um, so, you know, I come, my bank, my background is in banking where like I was pulling tons of data sets and I can look at, you know, precedent deals or whatever, but unfortunately that's not really how it is in early stage venture. So um, for companies with very little revenue or no revenue, like just being in the market, venture investors sort of have a sense of like what an appropriate valuation is, depending on the vertical traction, a lot of different things. Um, so that's why it kind of ends up being more of an art than a science. Um, so I don't know, we something we always, our founders ask that, ask, ask us that question a lot. When they're going out to market to raise subsequent rounds, they always say, what, what should we think about valuation? Like, what do we think it should be going, you know, before we start actually meeting with investors? And the advice we always give them is, there's no point in you really coming up with what you think your valuation can be. I mean, sure, you can do it if you want to, but really the market's going to tell you at the end of the day what they think it should be. And some of it's just like, you know, seeing where the wind takes you, unfortunately. 
Yeah, and I want to insert in there um, just a quick primer on convertible debt versus safes versus an actual valuation of the priced round. Um, so can you talk just about that and for some of the founders who might not even know what all those three options are? Yeah, so I mean, high level, you have two options when you're raising funding. You can basically do, um, as Lisa mentioned, the convertible note or the safe note, or you can do a priced round. And so if you do a high level, the difference between those two categories is a priced round will actually give you a firm valuation. So it'll tell you, hey, your company, we are valuing your company at $8 million. We are, you know, taking 10% of the company. And everyone is very clear in terms of what the company is valued at and how much they own of that company. Now, if you do a convertible note or a safe note, which are both popular options at the very early stage of a business, um, you're not getting a firm valuation. So you're not saying specifically like how much your company is actually worth. And it's not really clear how much you own because what happens is then when the next round comes along and is priced, those notes will convert and you don't really know what that's going to look like yet. So it's basically a stalling tactic to push valuation out because like the, some of the documents can be a little bit easier to push through. Um, but you know, typically as a firm, we tend to um, strongly prefer doing a priced round because we think it's better for everyone to just sort of be on the same page. They know how much of the company they own, they know how much the company is worth and sort of pushing those issues down the line can only confuse things for further rounds. Um, and we generally think it's best not to kind of create that confusion early on in the business. Like as a founder, you have a lot of things going on and it's better to have clarity when you can have it as opposed to like pushing issues down the line where like it'll cause a headache. So that's typically what we suggest. Got it. Um, and so if, if a founder is raising, what's the minimum that they would be raising if they wanted to do a price round? And is there a minimum? I don't know if there is like a minimum. I would say, you know, I don't know if there is a minimum. I feel like the smallest that we ever see is about like a million dollar round, but I don't think there has to be a hard and fast rule. I think you don't really, I feel like typically if it's less than a million, maybe founders will do a convertible note or a safe note, but I have no hard and fast rule on that one. Yeah, because from what I've heard, it's, um, you know, in that kind of pre-seed stage when it is very difficult to value the company. Yeah. Um, the, one, the one con from a legal standpoint, because I think one thing we should remember as founders that fundraising ha costs a lot in legal spend, um, especially if you're using a top law firm, a top startup law firm. And so the one thing about convertible notes is that versus price rounds is that convertible notes are actually significantly cheaper um, when it comes to initial legal costs um, and slightly less complicated because it's just a couple of pages in terms of a term sheet. Um, so if you're doing less than a million, it probably makes sense to um, start with something that's faster and easier. That's what I've heard. Yep, good point. Uh, a question from Abby, she said, regarding showing milestone goals for funding, if you're about to raise a seed or pre-seed that will give you a 12 to 18 month runway, do you just focus on milestones within that time frame, or do you have a five-year outlook approach when you will probably need to raise again within that time frame? Yeah. Um, well, first of all, is this feedback better? Because I know there was a note saying that there was like a feedback. Can you hear me okay? Or is it annoying? Because I'll put my headphones back on if it's like too loud on my side. It's good for me. It's good? Okay. Great. Um, so yeah, so the question of milestones. So we would typically focus on um, the milestones immediately within those 12 to 18 months. So basically what would you want to accomplish before you have to fundraise again? Um, and yeah, we would want to have a high level sense of like, generally here's how you think about the five-year business and what are like the kind of corresponding milestones. But again, you can't really put a lot of weight on anything that's really going to happen after the 18 months because there's so many variables at play. Like how much will you actually raise in the, you know, the next 18 months? How will that raise go? Um, maybe the business will have pivoted. So I wouldn't, you should have a high level understanding for yourself, right? Like if you're going to be like very goal oriented and you want to have this vision you're executing on, you should have a sense of like over the next five years, this is what I want to get done. Like I want to be in every grocery store in the country, whatever that goal is for you. 
Um, but I think when you're talking to investors focusing on the next 12 to 18 months, I think that's much more important. Great. Um, okay, let's see. What else? What are the questions we have? Um, how does Tribeca def define early stage? For context, we've got 55K in revenue through a mix of B2B and B2C. Yeah. Um, so early stage is like big. So Tribeca, we invest in seed and Series A, a bit more Series A than seed. Um, but all of these round names are fluid. So like you can kind of call things whatever you want to. Um, for us, what that means is we like to invest at least when companies have found product market fit and really need capital to scale like crazy. Um, so that's kind of like the right inflection point. And there can be different metrics that show that. So like, you know, it can be a revenue metric. It can be a user growth metric. There are lots of different ways to think about product market fit, but that's kind of high level where we think about, you know, ourselves fitting into the market. Great. Um, okay, we have another question from Kirti, and she said, would a VC firm invest in different companies from the same industry, maybe direct competitor? So VC firms have different philosophies on this. This is not a clear cut answer. So at Tribeca, we won't do that. Um, we do only about, you know, four to six investments a year. So we're very, very like involved with our portfolio companies. So like if we were invested in like Uber and Lyft, like that would be like such a direct conflict of interest for us because we're like really hands on and like know everything that's going on. Um, there are some BC firms though that have a different approach. Maybe they're a little bit more hands off. Maybe it's, you know, they get sign off from both parties and they're okay with it. You do sometimes see that. I think what's a little bit more common that you might see is if they are gonna invest in a direct competitor or if they're gonna invest in a competitor, maybe there are some nuances to it. So maybe one company does something similar in the US and the other one's approaching it in you know Europe. So they can take their learnings from one another, but the other the companies don't have plans to like cross over and you know expand into the other one's market. Or maybe they're doing similar things but for targeting different demographics. You still I think the most important thing though from a VC perspective is if you're gonna sort of get close to like doing something like that where it could potentially be competitive, is just checking with both CEOs and making sure everyone's okay with that because the last thing you want is like your CEO not trusting you or not being comfortable with you. So I think that's that's the most important thing there. And you, if you're ever in a situation, by the way, where like you find yourself talking to a VC firm where like maybe they have a directly competitive portfolio company or whatever, like you should be really upfront and be like, hey, I'm actually not sure I want to continue this conversation. Like you, you're totally valid in being able to say that. Great. And we talked about safe or convertible note briefly, but what are your thoughts on the new YC post money safe? If you do a price round, do you need to have valuation in your deck or do you leave that to discussion afterwards? So it seems like two separate questions. Okay. I don't think I have any thoughts on the YC post money safe. <laughs> so I will maybe get an opinion and get back to you separately about that. Um, if you do do a price round, you do not need to include that valuation in a deck. Um, I think that's more of a discussion point that can be done verbally. Um, I think when you are talking about fundraising, in your deck, you should say how much you have previously raised. You don't need to include the valuation and then how much you want to raise moving forward and what, um, what the use of proceeds would be. So um, on the safe side, I mean, for those who are new to it. It basically is a convertible note, but without interest and a maturity date. Um, so the safe is really the founder friendly version of the convertible note, because technically with convertible note, if you, let's say have a maturity date of 12 months and you hit 12 months and you aren't able to raise your next round, um, technically interest builds up. And you know, if you have an investor who's very, um, you know, very stringent on that, they might even want their money back. So that's actually happened to some founders before. Um, so the, in my, in my opinion, I think the safe, you know, if the investors, especially in San Francisco are willing to take it, um, that's become kind of common practice, uh, obviously more so as well on the East coast. Um, but it's a more founder friendly version of the convertible note is the basic way to explain that. Um, so 
next question. Um, Kirti says, does break even matter when you're raising a seed or pre-seed, meaning do VCs care about when you break even? It's another good question. So I think this actually, I think when you're that early stage, at least from my perspective, it, it doesn't matter a whole ton. I think it's actually a lot more about the entrepreneur's pr preferences. So like we have some entrepreneurs where like to them, it's really important that they operate break even to others. It's not. Um, so no, I wouldn't say like when you're that early, I, I wouldn't say it matters a whole ton. Great. And Renee says, in terms of inputs and outputs, any tips on how to quantify returns on hiring people slash putting salaries into budget? What's the best way to justify this? Interesting. So by that question, do you mean, um, how do you justify like hiring X number of people and like what their salaries might be? And like, how do you think about like the ROI on those hires? Is that the question? Yeah, it seems like, you know, sometimes people also think about how much do you pay yourself, the CEO, like what's appropriate to put in there? How much, you know, what, how much should you um, pay a CTO or a CMO? And how do you justify that? Yeah. So to an extent, some of that stuff is actually just like market data. Um, so like when our portfolio companies are hiring C-suite people, especially like a CTO or a COO, or even for yourself as a CEO, you know, there's to an extent you can be, find that stuff in the market. Um, and, you know, I, I can help point you to some of those, those resources separately, but um, as a CEO, when you're like really early on and it's kind of just maybe you and a couple of other people, um, especially as, as the CEO, like you should pay yourself enough that you can like live your life happily and comfortably because you are the CEO of a very early company. And like the last thing you want is like your CEO, like living this like very hard life where he or she's like not eating or like exercise, like, like you have to feel good to be able to execute on your business. So that doesn't mean like go live like a lavish lifestyle, and like, you know, throw down, but you know, pay yourself comfortably so you can live the life that you, you need to lead to build a big company. Um, so that's kind of high level how you think about it. When you're hiring people, part of it's like based on those milestones that we talked about earlier. So when you think, okay, over the next 12 to 18 months, this is what I want to accomplish. You should think about it from the perspective of, okay, I can't do everything. I need to outsource some of the stuff to people. What's the bare minimum number of people I need to execute on those 12 to 18 um, month goals. So if it's, you know, the kind of business where you're going to need, you're maybe a customer facing business and you're definitely going to need a marketing person, like that marketing person is definitely worth the money. If you're a very technical company, get that CTO or like the VP of engineering on board. Um, it just depends on the company, but that it shouldn't be too, too, if you kind of link it back to the milestones, it shouldn't be too hard to think about where you need to invest your capital. Great. Uh, Bobby wants to know, I'm launching a marketplace app soon. I've talked to some investors, but one informed me that B2B is more appealing to invest than B2C. Is that true? Uh, no. <laughs> Short answer is no. Um, I think that probably just is dependent on the investor. So there are some investors who love investing in direct to consumer companies, and there are some investors that like doing B2B. And there are some who like doing both, like we do. Like our company, our portfolio is pretty 50-50 split between B2B and D2C. Um, so yeah, short answer is, is no. Do, do whatever is gonna be best for you um, and your company. There may be certain verticals where B2B is viewed more favorably or D2C, but high level answer, no. Great. And is there a specific time of year that's best to start seeking funding? Yeah, so I think there's, there are two answers to this question. So the first is that um, from a seasonality perspective, you know, I think you don't want to start your fundraising in like November or December because a lot of investors will start to drop off around the holiday time. If you're starting the process in September with the goal of finishing up around the holidays, that, that works out fine. Um, because once you're committed, you're committed, but like you're not going to like get a first meeting like December 20th, that's probably not happening. Um, and then there's like a running joke that like VCs don't work in August. I'm working in August, so you should talk to me. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I would say like, it's totally fine. So I think a lot of entrepreneurs like get scared about like starting a fundraise process in like July. Um, 
I'm like, yeah, there will definitely be, you know, people are going on vacations and stuff in August, but like, if you're like a great company that they want to meet with, like, they will make time to meet with you. So like, I wouldn't like freak out too much about that stuff. Um, but I think the more important thing is like, you want to um, fundraise from a position of strength. So to the extent that you have the freedom or the ability to decide when you're going to start your fundraise, um, that I would think about, okay, like maybe you're, um, maybe you're a business that has some seasonality. So maybe like, you know, the summer months are really, really strong for you and you can like really show a lot of growth and traction in the summer months Then start fundraising at like, you know, September, because then you can show them all this amazing momentum. Um, and so again, it kind of feeds into the story and obviously you should continue to execute into September, October, whatever. Um, but I think showing them that growth as opposed to like, let's say maybe you're seasonally like depressed in uh, December, January, like, nah, probably not the best time to start fundraising. So I would just think about your own business and the fluctuations. Yeah, I, I, I would want to emphasize the idea of being in a position of strength and just not letting your fundraise drag on and on. Um, because I do think summer is slow. It's, it's funny when you think about like European investors, um, somehow I just think they're always on vacation and then summer especially is just crickets. Um, but yeah, so you don't want to say that you've been fundraising for three months, you know, the entire summer and then it not only gets um, bad reception, but then I think it's depressing for the founder as well. You're like, why is no one responding to my emails? Why is this taking yeah. so long? And, and just realizing that it will be slower. Yes. Morale is very important. It's and like, I think you like, resilience, morale, like those things are tough. Like you should know, like when you reach out to investors, like you just need one to say yes. Like, I think like, you know, the, fa the famous like Emily Weiss story with Forerunner, like when she was going out to raise money for Glossier, like I think she approached, do you remember how many VCs it was? It was maybe like 20 VCs and like Forerunner was like the one who believed in her and did it. Um, and now it's a unicorn. So like, awesome. But like, you know, you have to face a lot of rejection. So, um, keeping morale, finding ways to keep morale high and that resilience is important. Yeah, and I, I would um, say that 20 is actually very little. Yeah. Um, so think of like add another zero and like 200 rejections is probably, I think actually more in line with most, most yes. founders uh, experience. Um, so let's see, we have another question from Kirti. She says, what are some of the factors one should consider in deciding how to how to raise seed or pre-seed, especially if you don't have rich friends and family to put in their money. Um, should you do VC funding or accelerators or angels? Yes, I love this question. And this is something that I think about a lot. Um, I think, unfortunately, there's like this really silly notion sometimes in the market that like if you're a, you know, a startup founder, you can obviously go get your like rich friends and family members to like give you money. And it's like, well, that's awesome if you can do that. But like a lot of people can't do that. Um, so I'm really glad you asked this question. So I think it's really important. So what are your options if you don't have those friends and family members to tap into for resources? Um, like you said, VC funding, accelerators, angel investors, those are probably your three best options to consider. So there are different pros and cons and they're all pretty good options by the way. So, you know, I think you'd be fine no matter what you did. So I'll start with VC funding because that's like obviously what I do. Um, so if you are a pre-seed company, there are maybe, uh, there are probably fewer firms that will do like pure pre-seed, but there are a lot that will do seed. And there's actually tons and tons of capital available to seed stage companies. Um, so it's definitely a good option. And one of the benefits of working with a VC firm is that you actually get, you know, that sort of like, institutional knowledge that comes with working with a VC firm. So for example, like I've been in venture for two and a half years, the various partners at my firm, they've each been in venture for like over 20 years. So like they've seen, like they've been, you know, part of like hundreds of companies at this point. So like they know a lot of like the shortcuts, like, you know, Hey, if you're trying to sell into this type of company, skip these five people and just go straight and talk to this person. Like they can help you with a lot of the shortcuts that will help you scale faster. So I think that's a definite benefit. Um, I think accelerators are a really good option too. And um, they're just fulfilling like a slightly different need. 
So accelerators can be really good if maybe you're a little bit early for venture funding, but you want to set yourself up for it. And they can provide a lot of really great resources. So they can help you with hiring to an extent. They can help you think about how to actually build out your product. They can give you some intros. They're doing some of the same things that a venture fund is doing, but maybe a little bit earlier stage and um, in a more kind of systematic, programmatic way. Whereas with venture funds, it's a little bit more kind of like one-off, hey, what do you need from us? Hey, what can we help you with? Um, whereas an accelerator is more like a formal program. And at the end, you probably have some sort of like demo day where you would present to a bunch of different investors. And so that gives you a big network. So I think going through the accelerator path can be really good, um, depending on the terms of the accelerator and if you like drive with people and stuff. Angel right. investors right. is another good path. I think the thing that's tricky with angel investors is talking to you know a lot of entrepreneur friends I have who are trying to raise um, angel bonding is like actually trying to find the angel investors. Like Lisa, I'm sure you have um, you know tons of anecdotes about that, but like it can be hard to actually just like find people. A lot of that ends up being like through like LinkedIn stalking or hustling or going to like random events to find those angel investors. Um, and what that means is like, let's say you need a million dollars you might be able to find like one or two angels that can fill that out. But chances are you're probably gonna need a lot more angel investors to fill out a million dollar round. So that means you have to do a lot more work to actually fill out your million dollar round. Whereas if you go to a VP firm or an accelerator, you can probably like, you know, knock it down more quickly with that one person or that one firm. Um, all of those paths are great options. Um, it just depends on what you're sort of looking for and what help you need. And Kirti says, what do VCs look for in a first time non-conventional founder? Which I think probably means uh, non-white male, maybe no tech background. Um, so I'll say like, I don't like think about it like, I. I he maybe just a function of who I am as a person or something. I don't know. But like, I don't necessarily like differentiate the things, but what do I look for in a founder high level? Um, I look for someone who's really passionate about what they're doing. Like that's, that's like the number one thing. If you meet someone who's like trying to make a quick buck out of this company, like that's not as exciting to me. Cause like building a company is really, really hard. And so you need to have a founder who's like, so, like just lives and breathes this company. And like, this is their dream to make this thing work. I think that's when I get really excited. Um, someone who's obviously very smart and can like, has that sort of resilience and hustle to sort of continue to execute on their dreams, even when like doors get shut in front of them and all that kind of thing. Um, and someone who's very respectful, I think is also important. I think sometimes people don't care about that or they overlook that. Um, but I think respect and compassion are really important uh, traits for us as well. And that kind of, again, at the end of the day, it's really about hustle and tenacity. But I wouldn't, just based on the way you phrased that question, and I might be totally off base, but, you know, when you walk into the meeting, don't walk in being like, oh, I know I'm like a non-conventional founder or whatever, but still please find me. Like, you're awesome. Believe in yourself. Like, they are lucky to have you. So just like, walk in and like sort of like you're selling yourself at the end of the day when you're a really early stage company more than you are like you're selling the vision for the company and you because like you probably don't have a ton of traction to show so you're saying hey whatever happens whatever comes my way I'm going to be able to build I promise I will execute and I will make your money like worth it so like you gotta you know sell yourself at the end of the day yeah super important the the confidence um, and it, it's funny because I think every investor that I've ever brought into any SheWorks event or office hours, it's, you know, this question of always, what do they look for? And it, it's just consistently, it's passion. It's like passion, confidence, and your ability to tell a story. Um, so I think it's just really indicative that, you know, you can ask all these very tactical questions and get all these kind of high level answers, but there's just something intangible about like, the passion yeah um, that really resonates. we really want to see that like founders are excited like they are like I cannot wait to build this thing this is going to be awesome like you should be you should be like lucky to join me for this ride because it's going to be great cool so Grace has a question she says how and when do I decide to give up equity in my company as I raise funds it's such a personal thing for me and the thought of giving up precious equity to someone else feels daunting but I know sometimes it's the right decision how do I know yeah, that's a really important question. 
Um, and it kind of relates to something I mentioned in the very beginning. So equity is really precious. And it is like when like the company is your baby and like, you know what, it's not, not everyone does want to give up their equity. And that's totally fine. Like I know a founder where like I met him because he was fundraising and he ended up going through the process with a bunch of investors and he realized that he didn't want to actually raise any external capital. He realized it was just too hard for him to give up the equity and he was fine not taking on additional capital to kind of grow at the pace he felt comfortable with, but where he could actually still retain ownership over his company completely. That was more important to him than growing really quickly. So you kind of have to balance those, those things. Like, do you want to grow super fast um, and scale like crazy? Because that's what VC funding will hopefully get you if you know everyone executes properly. But if you don't want to do that, it's also okay to like totally build this really awesome business on your own. Um, the other thing with VCs, once you take VC money, is like you have someone to like, you know, you have someone to help you, but you also have someone like who has their own timeline for things. So you have to like you have another person that you need to like respond to, and not everyone wants that, and that's totally fine. So it's like it's sort of balancing all those different things, like the needs for your business and the needs for yourself to be happy. Yeah, I think that's also a really important point because um, I do think venture capital has been glamorized as the one and only way to build a company, and that's just simply not true. And I think it's it's just as respectable to build your company, you know, make revenue, scale it at your pace, have that full ownership and control over the vision. Because I think the one thing that um, a lot of the news headline, headlines don't mention is that you do give up control, especially as you raise more rounds and you, um, you know, have less of a percentage in your company. So I think this is, it's really a, a very personal question for you in terms of thinking about um, how to, um, how you want to grow your business. Let's see, we've got a question from Shani and she says, is there a resource or what's the best way to learn or be exposed to VCs? So I actually um, would love to share, we have a SheWorks Accelerator. So it's a, um, it's a fundraising boot camp. Um, so I just typed in the link here. Um, Niti has done office hours there as well, but we kind of teach you the nuts and bolts. Um, we have videos that teach you everything from what you need to put in your pitch deck, your pitch, um, how to talk about your financials, examples. Um, we've had tens of women go through this it, just in the beginning, since the beginning of the year. So um, all of these women have been really focused and it's a eight week program where you um, really get all your materials ready together and get to meet um, certain VCs through your journey and be with a group of other female entrepreneurs. So if you're interested in that, we are starting that in Q3. And then the other resource I want to share is... Um, we are now helping female founders who are interested in an alternative funding source um, to do equity crowdfunding. So equity crowdfunding is an, an alternative where rather than going to VCs, um, you have the opportunity to essentially crowdfund your company and have even unaccredited investors, your friends, your family can invest as little as $10 to um, get a small piece of equity in your company. And it's the only type of funding where women have outperform men by some 30% on average because we're naturally better community builders and storytellers and more empathetic. Um, that's, I would say that's a fact. Um, so if you guys are interested in that, I've just shared the links uh, for you there. Um, Nitya, do you have any thoughts on other resources? Uh, yeah, well, first of all, thank you for mentioning all of that stuff. I think that's really important. Um, I think having community is so nice when you're an early stage founder and crowdfunding is an awesome way to get capital. I should have mentioned that before. So thanks for mentioning all that. Um, in terms of other resources, um, I mean, Crunchbase is a really good one. And there, if you just like look up like blog posts and stuff, like if you like, you should kind of understand like what you're maybe looking for from an investor. So if you are a healthcare company and you really want healthcare investors, like you can Google like top, you know, healthcare VCs. Um, or if it's really, if you're, you know, like we, invest in mostly east coast based companies so like if that's important to you like you can google that and you'll find that out about us but also a lot of it's also just talking to people um so a lot of it's just like talking to like if you have founder friends or if you work in a co-working space like talking to like hey who are the vcs that you like talking to or not like talking to um because that's another just informal source of wisdom great 
Um, all right, so we have just a couple of minutes. So let me grab one last question before we wrap up. Nicola says, where does the company progress line lie between a pre-seed company and a seed company? What are the average ask sizes for each and what runway lengths should you, you be considering for each? Good question. So um, again, these sort of round titles are like big and fluid. So like you don't necessarily have to put like a ton of weight into them. And it's like, oh, so it's like, okay, if you call something a pre-seed and some people think it's a seed or vice versa, like no one's going to like penalize you for that. Like it, it, everyone just sort of knows it's fluid at this point. But I think high level, how I might think about it is like when the, the line to be considered a seed round has actually been moving farther and farther. Wing Venture Capital like published some really great data earlier this year about it. But, like the average seeds, I think like, I think like over 60% or something of like seed stage companies are generating some revenue by the time they raise the seed round. Um, and so the way we look at when we get seed investments coming through, they typically do have a little bit of revenue, maybe not a ton, but often like something to show that they're like building, going in the right direction. Um, Pre-seed would mean like almost revenue, no revenue. Maybe the product is starting to get built out or is built out and is just starting to turn on monetization. Um, that's kind of maybe the distinction, but again, I think that's probably dependent on the firm, the investor, whatever. So I, that's how, that's high level how I think about it. Awesome. Um, well, we are at the top of the hour, so I want to thank you, Nitya, for all of your really valuable advice and thank everyone um, who's still on the call and sharing all of your questions. I think it's, um, thank you for taking your time and sharing uh, your thoughts with media because I think it's always great for investors to know what are the questions that founders are really asking. Yeah, um, thank you guys. Really appreciate your really, really thoughtful questions. Um, and you know, feel free to, to connect on LinkedIn or anything. If you ever have additional questions, I'm always happy to be a resource. Thank awesome. you so much, Nitya and Lisa, for, for hosting this today. Um, for anyone who hasn't yet uh, joined the Women Made community, the link is in the chat. And this recording will be shared there and we'll have other resources for you available as well as the link to register for Lisa's next office hours, which will be July 11th. Great. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Bye. Thanks.